Good morning, and welcome to worship with us here at St. Paul's on this final Sunday of the month of June. We're glad you're here uh, as we prepare to uh, center ourselves and worship the Lord this day. Uh, just one reminder, uh, we will be online only uh, just for one more Sunday, uh, next Sunday. And then after that, uh, on, uh, beginning on July 11th, we will uh, be back to one service at 9.30, uh, both in person and live streamed every week through the remainder of the summer. And so we're glad to have you here with us today, and we hope to continue to see you uh, in the, the weeks uh, and months ahead, uh, however you choose to worship uh, with us. Let us begin our worship uh, today centering ourselves in the peace of Christ, uh, which surrounds our lives, blesses us, and gives us the strength we need each day. And so may the peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. I invite you to share that peace now with one another in whatever ways uh, you are able to uh, do this morning. It's time for the children's message. So I would like to invite all kids out there, whatever age you might be, to come gather around and hear what I have to talk to you about today. Today, I want to talk about interruptions. 
Now, interruptions can happen just about any... Um, interruptions can ha... Hold on one moment, please. Hello? Uh, no, I'm sorry, you must have the wrong number. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Bye. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Where was I? Oh, right. Interruptions. So interruptions are something that can happen at any... Yeah. Just a moment, please. Hello? An extended car warranty? Oh, well, no, I'm sorry. I'm not interested in one of those because I don't own an extended car. But thank you. Goodbye. Anyway. Interruptions are what happen whenever we are doing something and something else comes along to nudge it out of the way. Some interruptions can actually be good things, like maybe when we're outside playing and our mom or our dad calls us in to have lunch or to have dinner. It's important to eat, isn't it? That's a good interruption, right? There can also be bad interruptions. We usually call these distractions. And those happen when we're doing something that we're supposed to, but something else comes along and distracts us from what we should be doing. Uh, for instance, maybe when you're cleaning your room, you come across a toy you haven't played with in a while, and you suddenly start playing with that toy and find yourself playing with that when you're really supposed to be cleaning your room. That's a distraction. Well, we're about to hear a Bible story where Jesus gets interrupted. He is on his way to uh, the house of a very important official in the synagogue because the official has come to him and said, my, my young daughter is very, very sick, and I'm afraid she might even die. Jesus, please come to my house. Please come and heal her. And Jesus has set out to do that. But on the way, a woman reaches out to touch his cloak because she believes that just by doing that, she can be healed of a disease that she has and has had for many, many, many years. So listen to this story. And I'm going to let you decide whether you think this is a good interruption or a not so good interruption. What do you think? Let us pray. Dear God, thank you that you love me so much, that you interrupt me when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be. Help me not be distracted when I'm doing the things I should be. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope you have a great week, and I will see you next time. Bye. The reading is from the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 5. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered, gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, and, and your ha come lay your hands on her, so she may be well, made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and spent all that she had and she was, st was still no better but rather grew worse. She heard about Jesus and came behind him in the crowd, crowd and touched his cloak for she said but if I touch his clothes I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware of the that power had gone forth from him Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his di disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressed in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. 
But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came, f came forward in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When, when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he, put a, then he put them out all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him. He went, then he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, um, Tal Talicum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the, go the girl got up and, to be, and began to walk about. She was about 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them not, that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today we have this somewhat long passage of a couple of Jesus' healing miracles. And they are a couple of the more powerful healings that Jesus does uh, in any of the stories we have of him. Uh, today, we hear these two sensational stories uh, of, of two women at the very opposite ends of life. The first one is this woman who seeks Jesus out because she has had this, this bleed, this health issue, this, this chronic pain, this, this uh, defining uh, physical ailment for 12 years. And regardless of what her life was like before that, she cannot remember anything other than this pain, this, this torment, this sickness. And she has sought out Jesus out of her desperation, seeking to find some kind of wholeness, some kind of healing, because every other place she has looked, every doctor she's gone to, every priest, every specialist has been unable to make her well. And in her desperation, she has reached the end of her rope. Uh, on top of this illness, uh, is the fact that her very ailment, which of course she did nothing to, uh, to, to, to have befall her, separates her from the entire community. In her place and her time in the Jewish culture, because of her sickness and the type of disease that she had, she would have been seen as ritually unclean, just as much as the lepers uh, just as much as, as those uh, uh, shepherds or others who were at the periphery pushed out to the very edges of the Jewish culture and society. And so again, regardless of who she had been before, her whole life had been taken away from her. Her connections, her relationships, her support system. This woman is at the end of her rope. And she reaches out to Jesus and she reaches out her hand. She touches his robe. And she is healed. And then Jesus has this exchange uh, where he realizes that it's happened and, 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 and finds out who it was. And, and he essentially compliments her for her great faith in finding him out. And then we have this other story that, that very quickly Mark jumps to, as, as Mark does so often in his gospel, uh, jumping from one account of Jesus' great and mighty deeds and teachings to the next. And, and this next one is one of the most remembered of Jesus' healing miracles, uh, among other reasons, for the scope of what it is that Jesus does. 
this man comes to Jesus and, 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 and says, my daughter is unwell, and Jesus goes all the way to see her and to heal her. And by the time he gets there, the child has died. And so this young girl, so, so far removed from the, the, this other woman's experience, this young child who has only begun to experience life, has had it all taken away from her. And what's more, her family is deep in the grief and despair that is encountered in the loss of a child. And Jesus walks into this scene, into this room, with this deathbed within it, and says to them, the child is not dead, but sleeping. And he puts his hand to her. He says, little girl, wake up. And she awakens. And the family is, is made whole. Not just is this young girl brought back to life. All of the possibilities, all of those years and, and journeys and experiences ahead of her restored. But this family is itself restored. Made whole. Made well. And so in both of these stories, we have not only these profound uh, instances of Jesus healing broken bodies, of making people well, but we also have this radical restoration to relationship, to community, to being a part of the vibrant life of the family and of the greater community. This woman who was ritually unclean and suffering from her chronic illness, and this young girl and her family who had had everything taken away from them, restored. It seemed that there was no hope left. They had nothing but fear and despair and hopelessness. And Jesus flips the script on them and brings them joy and hope. That's the power of these stories. Uh, and, and that's the power of Jesus. See, Jesus opens that door for us. Jesus brings that possibility into our lives. When we uh, step back from ourselves and, and lean into the grace of God, we open ourselves to the possibility that life might have more joy and more hope and more good things in store for us than we can imagine in our own minds, than we could plan or prepare for or see as the likely progression on unfolding of events in that mental calculus that we all do each day. You, you see, what these stories tell us speaks deeply and powerfully to us right now in this period of time that we're living. Because we have just emerged from what has been a long couple of years. There's been so much pain, so much bleeding, so much death. There's been suffering and pain from the pandemic and its spread, from the, the arguments and cover-ups about it, from the debate Debates and, and disagreements about everything from wearing masks to, to closing businesses to, to just making choices as a society to try to walk our way through these dark and difficult days. And just now, in the past weeks and months, we are beginning to see that that might not be all that there is. We're beginning to, to see light on the horizon, vaccinations, reopenings, lowering, lowering rates of infections. And in that glimmer of light, that glimmer of hope, even while the pandemic still rages around the world, there is also an invitation and a challenge. Because we have been so impacted and so shaped by the dark times that we've been through, that as we've all observed, and if we're honest, probably observed within ourselves, 
there is a reluctance to step out of that darkness and pain and back into the light. It is challenging to sometimes to take that mask off, to start going out into the world again. But what's even more challenging than that, and I argue this is for all of us, regardless of our feelings on any of those other things, what's even harder is to admit the possibility that life has hope and joy and new, beautiful, and wonderful things in store for us. You see, when our experience, whether it's been through a year like this one or through a dark season of our own life, the death of a loved one, a sickness for 12 years, like the stories we heard today, we can easily, in fact, I think we almost always do, fall into this place where that is all that we can see. That is all we can conceive of. We just think that the future is going to continue to be that way in perpetuity. We see no hope. And we cannot sometimes even conceive of the possibility of joy. But what these stories tell us is that we too can be made well. We too can be healed And we can throw off that cloak of despair and step into the joyfulness of the new day that is only just dawning in our lives. And whether that's a new day at the end of a pandemic or simply a new day where you leave behind what's what's holding you down, what's, what's bringing you down, what's depressing you, what's bringing your life pain. The promise of this story and the promise of Christ is that there are good things in store for you. There are better days ahead. God has a plan and a purpose and a trajectory for your life that you have never imagined or conceived of. In this story, when Jesus is is talking with these people who are so locked into their despair, so, so... having tunnel vision in the darkness that they cannot see the light, he says this one beautiful and challenging line. He says, do not fear, but believe. Do not fear, but believe. These are our instructions. This is our operating manual to life in this moment and in any times when we find ourselves just, just sucked into the drain of darkness and despair. Because fear can overrun our lives. Fear can divide us and we see the ways that it divides us and it hurts us and it kills us in our society, in our culture. When, when nations and political parties are just warring with blinders on at each other. Uh, when, when, when we, within our families, within our homes, and within ourselves, are not at rest. When all we can see, all we can imagine is the bad things, the dark times, the, the cut-off possibilities, the aborted opportunities. But Jesus promises us That is never the end of the story. From every winter, there is spring. From every death, there is new life and resurrection. In fact, this is the cycle at the heart of creation. Not that things continue upon one trajectory, but that they go in these cycles and that it is in the darkness and the depths of despair that new life and new hope is being born and knit together. As we move forward in our lives, and as, as, as this church moves forward into the future, and as the Christian church as a whole tries to reform itself in these times after the pandemic, when we emerge out of our respective caves and homes and into the light, and we can hardly even see one another because it's blinding to us. All we are used to is being uh, uh, separated and away, and we begin to come back together. God is doing something at this moment in time, doing something like he was in the healing of those two women. 
And, and, and so I want to share something that I know I have mentioned to uh, some of you before, and I've shared as an illustration in devotionals at times, but I think it is more exactly true of where the church and where we find ourselves in our lives at this moment in time, as that light begins to, to shine over the horizon and we don't yet know what to do with it, that it invites us into a possibility for our future that we may have never imagined before. Uh, and what I want to share is from this book, Canoeing the Mountains, uh, by uh, the Christian author uh, Todd Bolsinger. Uh, he is a professor at Fuller Seminary in California. Um, and I've had the privilege to meet with him and, and work with him uh, a little bit in some of my uh, uh, time on the Synod staff. Um, but in this book, he, he writes about the times that he thinks the church is in today. And this book was actually written a few years ago, but before the pandemic, but I think it is particularly apt today. And this is the illustration he chooses to use. He's writing of the experience of Lewis and Clark on their journey of discovery across colonial America. Uh, and he tells this story and makes this point. He writes, he dipped his hands into the icy water and took a long, cool drink. Fifteen months of hard travel, a seemingly endless string of days of back-breaking upstream slogging had led to this moment. Meriwether Lewis recalled all that he had endured, nervous nights in a strange land, mosquitoes galore, a cold, dark winter, grizzly bears, a month-long portage around an immense waterfall, the death of a companion. But he was here. Lewis and a small scouting party had gone ahead of the rest of the Corps of Discovery to try to make contact with the Shoshone tribe. They had followed a small trail up a creek, and now were at the spring itself. This little trickle was the source of the mighty Missouri River. This water would flow all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. They had found what no person of European descent had before them and the most challenging obstacle on their journey from what was then the United States to the Pacific Ocean was now behind them, or so they thought. For over 300 years, explorers of at least four sovereign nations had been looking for a water route that would contact, connect with the Pacific Ocean to the Mississippi, Mississippi River, and everyone just knew it was out there somewhere. It was a broadly believed persistent assumption about the way that the world was set up. For Meriwether Lewis, slaking his thirst from that little stream meant that he was about to realize the dream of centuries of pioneers, to fulfill the ambitions uh, of his president and to enter into the pantheon of explorers. His name and his core would be remembered as the discoverers of the highly prized Northwest Passage. Lewis believed that he would walk up that hill Look down a gentle slope that would take his men a day and a half to cross with their canoes, and then they would see the Columbus River. After 15 months of going upstream, they looked forward to letting the current take them to the Pacific Ocean. They would crest the hill, find the stream, and coast to the finish line. They could not have been more disappointed. What Lewis actually discovered was that 300 years of experts had all been completely and utterly wrong. In front of him was not a gentle slope down to a navigable river running to the Pacific Ocean, but the Rocky Mountains, stretching out for miles and miles as far as the eye could see, was one set of peaks after another. There, of course, was no Northwest Passage no navigable river, no water route. The driving assumption of the best and the brightest, the most adventurous and entrepreneurial, creative leaders of their time had all been absolutely and utterly mistaken. As he stepped off the map and into uncharted territory, Meriwether Lewis discovered that what was in front of him was nothing like what was behind him. And what had brought him to this point in the journey would take him no further. Lewis faced a daunting decision. What would he do now? Lewis and Clark and their core of discovery were looking for a water route. But now they had run out of water. 
How do you canoe over mountains? The answer that Todd Balsinger eventually gets to is that you don't. You don't and you can't. Sometimes in life, as in a journey, you encounter a terrain that was never expected, that was on none of the maps, in none of your plans, and that none of your tools or things that have brought you to that point are going to get you any further on your journey. A little over a year ago, when we were entering into Lent, right before the pandemic started, we launched a Lenten theme here at St. Paul's. Into the Unknown, a Lenten wilderness journey. Little did we know just how fitting that theme would be for the journey we've all been on over this past year. But now, as we begin to emerge into the light of a new day, a new day for St. Paul's, a new day for our country, a new day for our world, now is the time when we, just like Meriwether Lewis, must re-examine everything about everything that we thought before where we must reimagine the future together. When we must realize that what is ahead of us is nothing like what lies behind us, but that what we have come through together has made us into who we are today. And that it can give us the strength to go to where God is calling us tomorrow. And so as we emerge from this pandemic, as we set our sights on the terrain in front of us and realize that it is nothing like what any of us ever expected to find. There is not only challenge, but also opportunity. In fact, it is exactly what God has been preparing us for. Because God is shaping us and preparing us for a future and a hope. God has good things in store for you and for this place, for this church, for this world. And if we can let go of our fear, of the blindness that lets us only see darkness and open our eyes to the hope and the possibility on the new horizon, then God can take us there. My prayer for you, for myself, and for our world on this morning and in the, the days ahead as we continue to, to emerge into this strange new land of hope and possibility in a post-pandemic world. My only words for you are the words of Jesus. Do not fear. Believe. Amen.
let us come before the triune God in prayer. Each time I proclaim, Lord, in your mercy, you are invited to respond with, hear our prayer. God of hope, the ministry of your church extends across borders from nearby neighbors to far and distant countries. Accompany all those who labor eagerly in service of the gospel, that through your good news, all might experience transformation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land that provides our food. Guard all species of plants and animals from harsh changes in climate and empower us to protect all you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing God, in your love, you know the circumstance, you know the need. Hear the prayers we bring to you this day for all those we know and love who are in need of your mercy and care. Grant healing and love to them. We pray for Frank, Haley M., Brian H., Jane, Joyce, Allison and Kara, Clarissa, Marion, Amy, Bob, Eric, Alice, Pete and Jean, Vicki, Dorothy, our friends and other residents at Simpson Meadows. We pray for all those we now name aloud or lift up quietly in our heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this assembly and all those gathered together in worship. Revive our spirits, renew our relationships, and rekindle our faith that we might experience resurrection in this community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Righteous God, we pray for nations and their leaders. Give them a spirit of compassion and steer them towards a fair distribution of resources that none among us would have too much or too little. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful ancestors in every age whose lives had pointed us toward you. Envelop them in your love that we may be reunited with one another in the last days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, Trust in your, in your abiding grace. Amen. And now let us confess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us gather around God's table, our place of refuge from the storms of life, our place of gathering to embrace and accept the love and grace of God. Uh, as always, uh, uh, this week, um, we are not passing the plate uh, to collect the offering uh, here at church, but I want to thank you for the ways that you continue to support the ministry of St. Paul's and invite you to continue to do so by donating online or sending a check to the church or by placing your offering in the plate as you depart. Let us ground ourselves in the hope and the promise that this sacrament holds for us this day and every day. And if you have a bite of something to eat and a sip of something to drink uh, there at home, I invite you to join us in this holy meal at this time. For we remember that it was on that same stormy night 
metaphorically at least, that Jesus was betrayed, that He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it for His disciples, saying, take and eat, this bread is my body given for you. As often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. And then again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, We remember the Lord's death until He comes once more. And so I invite you to pray with me now, as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come to the table, for the feast has been prepared. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And as you receive these gifts, remember that this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. I invite you to commune at this time and let us go with the blessing of Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His praise, my Gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of your name. The name of Jesus charms our fears and bids our sorrow cease, sings music in the sinner's ears, brings life and health and Speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor Keep us free.